John? Great. Thank you, Michael. I um, hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. Um, I thought that I would give uh, a more thorough update. I've done a few of these in the past, given the current market dynamic. If you turn to the second page, Michael, please. Michael, I believe you're controlling the deck. There you go. Um, great. So just a little bit about Entrust Global. Um, Entrust Global is a large uh, alternative investor um, with offices in New York. Um, been around since the late uh, 1990s. Um, currently have over 20 billion uh, in total assets. Uh, 45 investment professionals um, around the world. Um, and I've joined the firm a couple of years ago and brought over a team of uh, five dedicated aviation professionals. A little bit about my team, you know, our background stretches um, pretty long uh, into aircraft leasing and aircraft financing. And given the market dynamics and some things I'll talk about um, in the deck, I think the team is actually positioned quite well to, to make some interesting investments in the coming uh, years. Uh, if you turn to the next page, let me just first frame, you know, the commercial aviation industry pre-COVID. Um, so if you start in the top left, uh, the airline industry is represented by about 26,000 commercial jets, obviously different ages, different types, representing close to a trillion dollars in market value. The aviation industry as a whole has been vital um, to worldwide um, economies um, with about 65 million jobs related to aviation indirectly or directly, uh, huge impact on global GDP. And you can see in the chart on the bottom left, the percentage that the airline industry represents related to different regions around the world. So one of the themes that you'll hear me talk to is the fact that while the aviation and airline industry is for sure gonna go through a major reset, we don't think the industry is gonna go away. Um, you also had on the manufacturing side, uh, really a duopoly between Airbus and Boeing. Um, they were producing you know, 800 plus aircraft per year before the MAX got grounded. They are largely the major suppliers of aircraft to this industry, that's gonna change. You also had over 350 airlines that operated 10 or more aircraft. That's going to change. Um, and yet you can see in the bottom right, um, the amount of capital that this industry has required uh, over the past 10 years and what we think for the foreseeable future is quite significant. Um, just from new deliveries alone, you're talking about 150 plus billion dollars of aircraft that need to be financed. And in the secondary market, you have typically up to $50 billion of aircraft that need to be refinanced or sold. So there's quite an opportunity set, we think, ahead of us. If you flip to the next page, you know, historically, just to frame the industry, um, it has been through many market shock events. As a matter of fact, uh, this is an industry that many, much capital has come in over the last decade, predicated largely on stability. Um, so the industry has been through numerous market shock events. Um, air travel demand has been uh, extremely resilient. You can see that uh, since 9-11, uh, air travel demand has nearly tripled. Um, and on the other side, which has happened since really 1970, you've had a continued evolution to the operating lease market. It started very small, and it roughly represents about half the market today. So if you think about it as an index, Roughly, airlines own half their equipment and they lease the other half for a variety of reasons. Uh, if you flip to the next page, what is the major driver uh, historically and what we think will continue going forward? It's really uh, population demographics and an expanding global middle class. Um, you can see through some of these graphics that the middle class has grown tremendously um, over the last decade and will continue to do so. In 2020, you know, this year, the middle class has actually become the majority of the global population for the first time. With developing countries like China and India 
you know, you're, you're basically seeing 150 to 200 million people each year enter the global middle class. Um, obviously, some of the economic repercussions of COVID um, may impact that, but we still think the general trend is going to remain intact. And what does this mean? It means that more and more people have disposable incomes. And in a world that's become more globalized, people are going to travel. Um, we continue to think that's the trend going forward. If you flip to the next slide. Uh, before I get into some of the more COVID um, impacts, I thought it would be helpful just to baseline um, a proxy for aircraft risk, which I've used uh, what are called WTCs, which are aircraft-backed bonds. Um, there's been quite a lot of these, close to $100 billion issued um, since uh, the mid-1990s. Um, obviously, the airline industry in particular in the U.S. has been through restructuring and bankruptcies. Yet the recovery rate on these bonds through those restructurings and bankruptcies has been quite high. Um, in fact, higher than many asset classes in terms of downside risk. Um, this has largely been due to the industry over time um, reverting to the mean. So where you've had travel disruptions on this demand, in time it's reverted back. You've had the supply side of aircraft um, act somewhat rationally. So you, you're seeing that now with Airbus and Boeing, they've paused and reduced production of aircraft. You've seen a number of uh, both airlines and leasing companies cancel or defer aircraft deliveries. And as long as that balance between demand and supply comes back in a reasonable time frame, you will have a return to stability. And I think that these, uh, these data points reflect that. The other chart is a reflection of correlation. You know, we had a study done by one of the major appraisal industries. Interestingly enough, um, aircraft leasing is uncorrelated to a lot of major categories that investors are in. Things like infrastructure, high yield, actually airlines themselves, um, real estate, leverage loans, and the MSCI. So from a diversification standpoint, it's an interesting investment. If you flip to the next page, you know, so basically getting into a little bit of what's going on, you know, we believe within my team that the airline industry is going to have defined winners and losers. And if you go back in time, um, especially in the U.S. market, which was regulated at one point in time, we think we're entering uh, an arena that feels a bit more like that. Most of the airlines that um, are likely to survive are going to survive largely because they have support from their underlying gut governments. You're starting to see this. I have a chart on it later in the deck. There's already been over $100 billion of government support provided to airlines worldwide. More than half of that is in the U.S. But in that regulated environment, the airlines actually did pretty well. When you introduced competition, you had a series of bankruptcies using the U.S. as an example. And that essentially weeded out airlines that didn't make it and through consolidation in the US, you actually had the picture in the far right of the bottom graph, which was really record um, profitability uh, by airlines around the world, which was really dominated by US major airlines. Um, if you look at the bolded sentence in the middle, um, this speaks largely to the different dynamics pre-COVID. In the US, you had four major airlines that were responsible for transporting roughly 80% of domestic traffic. And in Europe, that equivalent was, took 40 airlines. So even before COVID hit, you had a, a pretty un imbalanced um, European market as an example. We think that's gonna be corrected. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through, if you, if you flip to the next page. One more. So here's a stark, um, snapshot as to where we are. I mean, demand really couldn't have fallen off more of a cliff than what's happened with COVID-19. The chart on the left shows really the amount of aircraft that are flying relative to the capacity available, and it's really at all-time lows. In fact, a lot of these aircraft that are operating uh, are operating empty. Um, you can see in the chart on the top right um, as a metric for how many passengers are screened by the TSA. It's basically at all time lows. And if you look at the chart on the bottom right, 
the blue line has now fallen to a level that's almost equivalent to what the fleet size was in the 1990s. Um, because that's how many aircraft have been parked or grounded given the reduction in demand. So very bleak picture right now for demand for travel. Uh, if you flip to the next page, this is bigger and deeper than the previous two large um, shock events being 9-11 and the global financial crisis. Six to seven times more impactful if you look at the measurement of airline revenues. Um, even since I put this in there, it's, it's even projected to be, to be worse. Um, my team on the right side has analyzed over 350 airlines around the world. And it's important to note that this industry has always been fragile. Um, many airlines around the world are not capitalized to deal with you know, prolonged periods of travel disruption, which reduces their near-term revenue. Um, so a lot of airlines aren't going to make it. I mean, if you look at the bracketed um, row, we, we're assuming about 75 to 100 airlines go away, get absorbed or go insolvent um, sometime between now and the, and the rest of the year. Um, but again, there are, there are going to be opportunities, and I'll, I'll talk about what those are. Um, if you flip to the next page. Yeah, you know, what we've done is we've really used the experience that we've had, and it's important to remember that you know my team has successfully invested through 9/11, through the global financial crisis, and we've really developed a few different um, cases for the rebound of travel. Our base case, as you can see on the on the right side, gets back to let's call it normal travel levels um, sometime by the middle of next year. Um, in a severe case, which we run through all our investments, you never really get back over the next few years. You kind of languish along. Um, and in an upside case, whether it be through, you know, a more accelerated vaccine, you know, we're, we're getting back to normal, um, you know, close to the early part of next year. Um, and what you'll see is as we go through the investment categories that we look at, we layer these different views of the world into each of them to make sure that it has a reasonable downside protection and a good risk rate, uh, risk weighted return. Flip to the next page, please. So one of the things that you're gonna see as you have less airlines in the world is you're gonna see the airline fleet shrink. So as I mentioned, you have roughly 26,000 commercial aircraft in, in operation. If you look at the bottom right, these are a number of aircraft that are out of production or less favorable, and airlines have indicated that they're gonna be no longer a part of the go-forward fleet. So the 27% of that graph, those aircraft are likely to never come back into service. And that reduction of supply will help counterbalance in the near term the, the reduced level of travel demand. So again, as long as that supply and demand come in somewhat balance, the industry will be able to plod forward until it gets out of this, this period. Most all of the airlines that we focus on are, are, are the survivors. Um, and I'll talk about that when we look at some of the investment categories that we find interesting. If you turn to the next page. You know, so what is travel going to be like, you know, after this? I mean, if you think about it, this industry and the world has been through a number of things before this. You know, we went through 9-11 um, tragedy um, and we came out the other side really in a new normal in terms of travel, which required removing your shoes, taking liquids and putting them into a plastic bag, removing your laptop, reinforcing cockpit doors. It took a while for people to get used to that, but it became the new normal. There are going to um, unequivocally be new normals now. Um, but if you think about it, for the most part, after 9-11, there really haven't been any large-scale uh, strategies or large-scale um, uh, uh, terrorist activities. Um, if you think about the global financial crisis, um, through regulatory measures, capital requirements for banks, you know, we really haven't had another um, event like that, thankfully. 
And hopefully after this pandemic, this industry will be more prepared in the world for these types of things. It's a shame that we have to go through these to better prepare ourselves, but that's the reality of it. Um, we are starting to see traffic pick up somewhat in China, which, um, which got hit first. It's, it's to be determined if the rest of the world follows suit in a similar time frame. And again, we do believe, you know, our view is that the, the propensity for humans to travel is going to continue. I don't think people are going to secularly supplement travel with these Zoom calls. Um, I think it's going to come back. And you can see, even by just looking at the proxy between China, India, and the U.S., there is a lot of room to grow for places like China and India per capita, which are countries that are growing very, very quickly in terms of global middle class expansion relative to the US. If you go to the next page, um, this is just a team. I mean, we have um, experience doing many of the things that we're about to talk about um, in terms of aircraft backed bonds in the secondary market, aircraft backed securitization paper, um, relationships that span 20 years with. Um, really every incumbent capital provider in the space as well as airlines. So we're currently seeing um, a huge amount of pipeline. I'll touch upon it um, in the next few slides. If you please go to the next page. So, I mean, basically we, we're seeing a complete seismic shift in pricing. If you look at the uh, primary market, you know, we sort of spotlight a few different types of deals. So you have a primary sale and leaseback which would be a situation where an airline wants to sell airplanes that it owns and lease them back for a period of time, typically seven to 12 years. You know, those transactions were pricing pretty tight, especially for higher quality airlines, call it five, six, 7% returns. They're now three, three to four times that in today's market. You have a number of incumbent players, uh, pretty much all of them, uh, which include banks, um, leasing companies, airlines and even the manufacturers, which are all in one shape or another distressed. So we expect to see um, the sale of aircraft that become more profitable for buyers that, that, that aren't as impacted, which includes Blue Sky. Um, and then you have primary loans. I mean, we have a couple billion dollars of loans that we're right now uh, analyzing for many, many high quality airlines that you could really articulate will not go away. There's, there's a, a sort of a too big to fail component with some of the airlines around the world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to our investment framework. Um, the primary market generally, in my opinion, tends to reprice itself more slowly than the secondary market. So we've been more active in the secondary market on the bottom um, half of the page in things like aircraft back bonds. A lot of these are issued by US majors. Um, aircraft back securitization paper, where you have enough diversity in the senior tranches where we think there's good amount of protection. Um, and then you have you know, the other parts of the capital structure of airlines or leasing companies. Um, and we're looking at all of that right now. We, we feel it's, uh, there are attractive entry points, more attractive really than ever before in my career. Um, if you go to the next page, so how are we investing in really in, in an industry that's in the eye of the storm? Well, if you look at the criteria on the left part of this chart, these are the types of elements that we really want to see in deals. I would say probably chief amongst them is, is the airline considered high quality? Does it have the type of liquidity that can weather the current situation? And in addition, does it have one form or another of a backstop? Is it owned by a particular country? Is it vital to the, to the economies of a country? And you're starting to see, if you look around the world, where the governments have really stepped up. Is the structure diversified? So this is really akin to a securitization paper. Is there a waterfall with enough different aircraft at different airlines that on the whole, there's going to be enough cash flow to support the bond that we target at the price level we target. And, and we've analyzed that entire universe and find some of it compelling, some of it not so compelling. Is the collateral 
um, in demand such that even if an airline, let's say in the US, does want to go through a chapter 11 restructuring bankruptcy, there's a strong likelihood that that airline's not going to go away and that the collateral that we've invested is critical to their future and is going to be affirmed in, in part of that restructuring. Um, things like cross collateralization, cross default, um, these are items that we look at in, in most all of the deals. And you can see, as you, as you look to the right, these are really the categories that we're primarily focused on right now. If you go to the next slide, um, this is just a chart that I pulled just to give you all a sense of where governments have, have stepped up um, and started to provide support to certain airlines, I'll say, within their, within their home country. Um, next slide, please. I mean, this is the opportunity. I mean, basically you have every major incumbent player has one or more challenges. The airlines obviously have a challenge around how do they react to the new revenue environment, some of the new standards that are gonna be required to, fly, to, to fly. The aircraft leasing business um, has a number of deals that it's gonna to need to restructure and work its way through. And many aviation banks um, have really moved to the sideline. And, and so it, for players like ourselves, which have the benefit of not having a balance sheet that's under pressure um, and capital to deploy, we're able to sort of look around the world through this relative value prism and, and do the deals that we think make the most sense. And if you go to the next slide, you know, this is just a slide, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you know, basically we have a lot of data which shows country by country how important um, aviation is. Um, and, you know, we don't think this is an industry that goes away. We think that it's an industry that's gonna come out restructured. I think on the other end of the restructuring, the airline counterparties are actually gonna be stronger than when they went in because the market environment's gonna have far less competition um, it's probably going to take two to four years to get to that point, but there's going to be substantial liquidity needed in that bridge. And, and that's, that's something that we're looking to, to participate in. If you go to the next slide. Okay. Well, that, uh, that was a lot. I tried to go through it quickly, um, to respect the time boundary, but, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, if you just provide them to Michael, it can do it offline. But thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. John, thank you very much for doing the presentation. It was extremely informative. And we very much appreciate you guys being part of our organization and having your insight uh, into the aviation space right now. We wish you the best of luck. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you.